Peace. All praise and glory to the mighty most high, our creator who's one, the supreme, the almighty, the eternal, the always existing, perpetual, omnipotent force that moves all things in place. We're here at the Sabbath year, Leviticus number 25. And the Lord said to Moses at Mount Sinai, Why does the word sin in Sinai and you have also AI? Huh? Artificial intelligence, Mount Sinai? Could something be at Mount Sinai that none of us know about? Maybe a generator, a power source? Just throwing it out there. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, again, Israelites are the elites, children of light, right there, the Israelites, okay, and say to them. Now, when I say the Israelites, folks, I'm talking about a nation of children of God that are with their faces dark to the ground. Dark in this case means um, black. So the Israelites, the true children of God, the Israelite children of God are a black nation. Now understand me what I tell you right now. The Adam and Eve, the Adamic bloodline that takes place is all that comes into life. Okay? Without these two, the second man and woman that were created and had the breath of life placed on them, then living life as we know it wouldn't exist on this plane of existence because all living, breathing humans come from the second race. Adam that was created in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 and Eve in chapter 2 verse 21 and 22. So understand that, okay? We're... uh Two different races that have been crossbreeding with one another and Nephilim is what has been bred, what we've been breeding out. And we've been doing it since the very beginning of time, since Adam and Eve were booted out of the garden. So what was God's purpose? If God had perfect design as one with the scales off their eyes, what would I say? I would say that God was putting his spirit back into this plane of existence to give those fallen angels an opportunity to learn through these beautiful children of the Most High. So speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I am going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years sow your fields, and for six years prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a year of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord, do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your unattended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you, for yourselves, your male and female servants, and the hired workers and temporary residents who live among you, as well as for the livestock and the wild animals in your land, whatever the land produces may be eaten. The year of Jubilee. Count off seven Sabbath years, seven times seven years, so that the se seven Sabbath year amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the trumpet sound everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the Day of Atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the fifteenth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family, property, and to your own clan. The fifteenth year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the unintended vines, for it is a jubilee, and it is to be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. In this year of jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. If you sell land to anyone of your own people or buy land from them, do not take advantage of each other. 
You are to buy from your own people on the basis of the number of years since the Jubilee. You must buy from your own people on the basis of the number of years since the Jubilee. Now, I'll be quite honest with you folks. I I don't study this part, this, uh, these Jubilees, these years, these special days. There's other channels I listen to that are much better. Uh, Anna, Anaya Obadiah, she, she's pretty good at these, uh, the feast years and, uh, time frames. Um, I just, I just read this Bible and try to make sense of it, but this understanding this kind of information isn't what's important to me. What's important to me is get the message out of one God. And also, I want you to consider black people in this nation, since, since they've been brought here, have always had a difficult time purchasing and buying homes, correct? I know that I'm right on this. So, um, you pay probably at least 25, 30% more than what a white couple would pay for a house. So they really have put the screws to you here in this, uh, the selling of any properties and stuff like that of land as well. So consider that as well. And they are to sell to you on the basis of the number of years left for harvest crops. When the years are many, you are to increase the price. And when the years are few, you are to de decrease the price. Because what is really being sold to you is the number of crops. Do not take advantage of each other, but fear your God. I am the Lord, your God. Now, mind you, folks, this is important as well to understand. <clears throat> Lord is eternal. God is Elohim. Elohim is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This God here was given power from the supreme being. The Lord uses these mankind, these creatures that he's created to do corrections. Okay? If you're in the line of fire, then God is going to correct you in the line of fire. If that's the way it works. If you're out fornicating with multiple mates through the course of a year then what's going to happen eventually is you're going to fall in love with one and then that woman there is you're going to be the one that marries that woman there and then she's going to rip your freaking heart out she's going to be a cheater she's going to be a thief she's going to be a crook you know a fornicator she's just going to be the worst of worst because that's the way the spirit rolls why because he said not to fornicate so that's what you, when you fornicate that's what happens you fall in love with the fornicator when you fornicate, you find fornicators. And that's just the way it is. Follow my decrees and be careful to obey my laws and you will live safety safely in the land. Then the land will yield its fruits and you will eat your fill and live there in safety. You may ask, what will we eat in the seventh year if we do not plant or harvest our crops? I will send you such a blessing in the sixth year that the land will yield enough for three years. While you plant during the eighth year, you will eat from the old crops and will continue to eat from it until the harvest of the ninth year comes in. So that's pretty awesome, you see, because, because the ancients understood exactly the nutrition and stuff inside of the land and what it offered by allowing to the land to replenish. Because you got to understand that this plane of existence is a living, breathing plane of existence as well. And naturally, our ancestors are cutting down everything with these machines now at such an incredible rate. Picking back up at 23, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. So selling land and everything, so this is what's kind of a... a thorn in the side is all land this entire plain should have been given freely to all of us correct well not on this plane here no because this plane here is evil okay you are you were cast out into a world where there was nothing but a bunch of evil parasites and there were some good people there has to be good because it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil 
foreigner. Throughout the land, okay, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is is not the land because the land is mine and you reside in the land as foreigners and strangers. Throughout the land that you hold as a possession, you must provide for the redemption of the land. If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold. If, however, there is no one to redeem it for them, but later on they prosper and acquire sufficient means to redeem it themselves, they are determined the they are to determine the value of the years since they sold it and refund the balance to one to the one to whom they sold it. They can then go back to their own property, but if they do not acquire the means to repay what was sold will remain in the possession of the buyer until the year of jubilee. It will be returned in the jubilee and they can then go back to their property. Well, isn't that a sweet little gift? Got to return the property anyways, huh? They That means that, that six years later, after you've, you've sold your home, your property, and the jubilee year comes around, and even if you don't have the, the money for the property that was once yours anyways that you sold, that means that that person that bought the property for you is out that that uh that money that he put into it how's that work does that sound right to anyone i'm just reading the bible as i hear it as as what it's presenting itself to me and this is a presentation of somebody giving uh money to another person and sell of a property into a title of a property and then after so many years that property has to be given back to the person anyways that's kind of odd Okay, anyone who sells a house in a walled city retains the right of redemption a full year after its sale. During that time, the seller may redeem it. If it is not redeemed before a full year has passed, the house in the walled city shall belong permanently to the buyer and the buyer's descendants. It is not to be returned to the, uh, in the Jubilee. Okay, well that, that makes a little more sense now then. Uh, but houses in the village without walls around them are to be considered as belonging to open country. They can be redeemed and they are to be returned to the Jubilee. The Levites always have the right to redeem their houses in the Levitical town which they possess. So the property of the Levites is redeemable. That is a house sold in any town they hold and is to be returned in the Jubilee, because the house in the town of the Levites are their property among the Israelites. But the pasture land belonging to their town must not be sold. It is their permanent possession. If any of you fellow Israelites become poor and are unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner and stranger so that they can continue to live among you. So, we are supposed to be kind and loving and helping of one another, not capitalizing and placing others into slavery when a person is down. I mean, folks, you got to understand that these drugs and the alcohol and everything that takes place is because of the government's. They put the dysfunction out there. They create the police state and then they beat you down with it. And then the, the spirit, he's the one that's saying the spirit, the creator is telling you you're not supposed to engage in these things. So he's, he doesn't play with you, man. He just puts scales over your face and lets you fall. And it tells us plainly that two thirds of God's children will perish for lack of knowledge because you guys have went into the worship, pagan worship of the Gentile gods. Do not take interest or any profit from them, but fear your God so that they may continue to live among you. You must not lend them money at interest or sell them food at a profit. Well, holy shit, isn't that what the entire banking system is all about? Is lending money at usury costs? Spirit's telling us not to do that. 
Can't you see that everything that the Bible tells you what you're not supposed to do, this plane of existence walks completely opposite of it? So, nothing is supposed to be lent with money at interest or sell them food at a profit. See? And that's what this whole damn... The, uh, this place needs to replenish, man. We need to... These ancestors of ours, these leaders, these people are supposed to be servants to the masses who put in position. These world leaders, they, they are... Uh, they're demons, and you need to wake up to that. You must not lend them money at an interest or sell them food at profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. So God here, the Lord, supreme, eternal, your God, Elohim, good, who brought you out of Egypt to give, who brought you out of Egypt Moses brought you out of Egypt, right? The Lord, your God, used Moses to bring you out of Egypt, to give you to the land of Canaan. Now, this is, now, I'm just asking questions. For me, this is kind of always weird. I'm like, well, why would the Spirit, the Lord, your God, bring you into the land of Canaan and give you a land that was stained with sin and iniquity? Because... The canon laws and Canaanite people are stained. They have sin and iniquity on them. So why, would, why wouldn't why would the Spirit just bring you to a beautiful land that was all yours, that was pristine, untouched by war or death and all that? Because that's what this plane of existence is. It's perpetual war. It's what it is. If any of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to you, do not make them work as slaves. They are to be treated as hired workers or temporary residents among you. They are to work for you until the year of Jubilee. Then they are, then they and their children are to be released and they will go back to their own clans and to the property of their ancestors because the Israelites are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt. They must not be sold as slaves. Do not rule over them ruthlessly, but fear your God. And and I'm sorry to say, man, that that they've got a they got a shabby deal. They've been ruled over ruthlessly since the beginning of time. I wonder if you've ever been out of slavery. If it's ever in this Bible, so much has been taken from it. Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them, you may buy slaves. So, now you got this God here that's telling, he's condoning slavery. He's telling you that it's okay to buy slaves. Okay? Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I'm not okay with, like I said, now remember, this God here that we're talking about is Yahweh. All right? This is uh, the laws of Yahweh, 613 laws of Yahweh. So this God, Yahweh, is the one that's given this command. And he's the one that's telling you that it's all right to, to purchase slaves. Let's read it again. Your male and female slaves are to, are to come from the nations around you. From them, you may buy slaves. You may buy slaves. So, <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm just like... Didn't didn't this nation here free the slaves? So what God is condoning slavery? It's not a God that I worship. I don't worship any God that condones any kind of slavery at all. I worship the Supreme Spirit. All right. And these gods that condone slavery and stuff like that are used of the spirit. You may also buy some of your temporary residents living among you and the members of their clans born in the country, and they will become your property. Oh, so mankind, this is like indoctrination. No wonder why slavery was so prevalent in the in ancient days. I mean, I know slavery's all over the world still today, but I mean, we we abolished, well, we didn't abolish slavery. They just 
turned us into slaves in a different manner. They created a money construct and they keep the money machine printing for themselves and then they trickle the money out to pay their to pay their employee wages and stuff, man. It's all it's all a sham. You can bequeath them to your children as inherited property and can make themselves make them slaves for life. But you must not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly. So one Israelite's okay to to uh, have a slave, but you're still not supposed to rule over them as slaves, not ruthlessly. But if there's two thirds of God's children that are in this system here, then they're the ones that are ruling over you ruthlessly. You you must understand, Hebrew man, that you have rulers, Hebrew rulers, that are keeping you held back from your your power, your natural source, because of because they've got you worshiping them and praising them. Okay, the spirit of God says, go straight to Him and go straight to Him alone. So you don't need these priests to uh, for your to create these kind of rules of slavery okay this, i'm just reading you how i see it your your higher priests are okay with even the hebrew brother being slaves just don't rule over them ruthlessly if a foreigner resides among you becomes rich and any of your fellow israelites become become poor and sell themselves to the foreigner or to a member of the foreigner's clan they retain the right of redemption after they have sold themselves. One of their relatives may redeem them. An uncle or a cousin or any blood relative in their clan may redeem them. Or if they prosper, they may redeem them themselves. They and their buyers are to count the time from the year they sold them up to the year of Jubilee. The price of their release is to be based on the rate paid to a higher worker for that number of years. If many years remain, they must pay for the redemption a larger share of the price paid for them. Well, that sounds like, you know, a butt screwing there, if I may say. Oh, well, we're going to let you out early because you got a lot of years and stuff. You got to pay. It's like, it's like freaking bank fees, man. That's what this all sounds to me like. A bunch of freaking bank fees written up from the earlier ancestors. It's what it sounds like to me. If only a few years remain until the year of Jubilee, they are to compute that and pay for the redemption accordingly. They are to be treated as workers hired for, from year to year. You must see to it that those to whom they owe service do not rule over them ruthlessly. Even if someone is not redeemed in any of these ways, they and their children are to be released in the year of Jubilee, for the Israelites belong to me as servants. They are my servants, whom I brought out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so listen, I'm going to go down here. Let's check something out here. Give me one second. So here with that last verse of the Bible, 2555, for the Israelites are my servants, okay? The Israelites, the widest sense like from Banan, a son, all right? Like, etch, um, for the Israelites are my servants, they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord. This is Yahweh. Okay. Now, if you read the Samaritan tablets, this connection of Yahweh comes from Enlil. Okay. And then you have Jehovah. So you have two different names once again in the parables. Okay. This is what the Greek Yehovah, and then Yahweh, and then you have Yah, you have Yahweh, and then Jesus, you have Yeshua, Yahweh Shai, Jesus, Iesos. Um, too many names for God. God is one God, and this is what it means when he says 
that you're not to invoke the names of other gods or have them heard across your lips. Okay? God is one. And when you're born into this realm, folks, you're born with the memory wipe. Okay? And then you're only taught what you're taught. And the only because you're being taught by mankind. But if you stop what you're doing and you turn to the spirit of truth, the living God, then you're walking aligned with him. Good things will happen for you, man. You you God's gonna protect you, he's gonna guide you, and you're gonna have a good life. And I just wish that I understood this at a much younger age. But I clearly had to go through a lot of trials, a lot of pains, uh torment, suffering, grief. Uh, wickedness and a lot of evil in my own life before I could really have the skills removed so that I understood what was taking place. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Everybody have a blessed day. This is White Raptor News Ministries.